the Puritans in the punk world, we were not cool anymore. We were like persona non grata. It was like, go fuck yourselves. You guys are not punk. You know, which for me is like just another example of like punk ethics gone wrong where I'm like, yeah, I get it on the surface, but also give me a fucking break. So sorry, this person's not welcome because of who his mom is. Like, that's cool for you. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000 punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Before we start, check out my dude Dana Boland's two-week notice podcast where he interviews pretty big names in the music world. I was also lucky enough to get interviewed by Mr. Bolin. Uh, it's episode 105. If you want to check it out, you can just go listen wherever you podcast. Link Andy was a ska band from the northern part of California. Uh, I've done two interviews so far with Adam Davis, so you can go check those out. And you can check out my intro I did about the band back then, because I don't really feel like doing this again. But Matt was the first guitar player in the band, so I wanted to kind of get like the perspective of the beginning band member, because Adam Davis was the guitarist later on in the band in the second iteration. So Matt was in the first iteration, so I wanted to ask him questions about the band, and uh, also his new movie, Scream, which he directed, which we'll talk about. I reached out to Matt, asked him if he wanted to be in the podcast. He said, fuck yeah. I don't know if he actually said it like that. but So I got him on the Skype, and this is what we chat about. Directing the latest Scream movie, starting the band, the first practice with Nick, being seen as a scrappy band, not thinking they were a ska band, not being welcomed by the Gilman crowd, getting banned from Gilman for the verbal kint video, how he got the song that's in the credits for the movie Scream, and a ton more. Now, there's a part at the end where Matt's audio changes a little bit. I think it was because um, something, something happened that you take his headphones out. So you'll see, like, is a bit of a change. Um, but I figured I'd give you a heads up. It's nothing crazy, but you'll notice it. Make sure you go check out the new Scream movie, which he co-directed. And uh, it's in theaters now, so go do that. I really want to keep this intro short, so feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. I just listened to the Penelope Spheris of uh, Turned Out a Punk, and she talks so much shit. And I was like, wow, I love that she just doesn't care. Like, Wait, who is that? Is she the one who got, just left that band, that all female band or something? No, she was in a. She, she's like, a, she did like the decline of Western civilization movies and then became kind of like a, you know, she's like Wayne's World and that shit. But she kind of got all her roots in the punk rock, like LA scene. Okay. Wait, was she um, Stacy? No, no, she 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 directed the movie. Oh my god, everyone! I think people listening would be like, "Dude, you're such an idiot." That's fine. <laughs> I'll take it. No, it's great. She just talks shit. Talks shit about dead people, and she's like, "I don't fucking care. They were assholes." I was like, "Oh wow, <laughs> man, you do not care." <laughs> were these movie people or band? Like, who were the people she was talking Both. shit about? She talks shit about a lot of band people, and she talks shit about all movie people. <laughs> wow, and that, I mean that's the industry that you're baked into, right? Now, yeah. That was the first question I had, and so you get the theme of this whole thing. It's all about like the late '90s punk scene, and Definitely. yeah, cool. So we're gonna go back to that, but sometimes I'm just in a spot that makes total sense, especially now. How does one become a director of a Scream movie? I mean, great question. Uh, you know, I, I I mean, we got really lucky to be honest. We we had made our previous movie it was called Ready or Not, and it was with some of the same people, and the writer and producer of Scream, one of the writers, he had produced Ready or Not. And when he got the opportunity to take over Scream, he basically just raised his hand and said, I want my friends who did Ready or Not to do it. And it was, I mean, it was all serendipitous. Like we just kind of got it. Usually you pitch for a long time and it's a, you know, a lot of like, oh my God, is it going to work? Are we going to get the job? And this was just like, hey, do you guys want to do this? It was that, it was really that simple. It was really crazy. And it was just because we had had such a good time making the previous movie together. Have you, have you been interviewed about the movie? Yeah, I've spent a lot of the last two weeks doing interviews about it. So it's actually really nice to be doing an interview that's also about some punk rock stuff. <laughs> I was like, cool. I just had to ask you that one question. Um, no, we can talk about it all you want. I don't care. I'm okay. I, I, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so relevant. And it's just to me, I mean, the first scream when I saw that that as a I was like 17 years old, and I remember actually this funny story. Um, so the old band I was in, Lane Meyer, my buddy Chris was in it, and like we started it, and we left like we either saw a scream or 
we had already seen it, and I think we were coming out of that one, or we were in a different movie, or walking by a movie theater, and there was like another one playing, and he opens the door and just yells, he's like, the boyfriend did it. <laughs> And then oh, we Jesus. just like ran, and it's like right as the movie started. <laughs> yeah, he was Twitter before Twitter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was that. He was that that's real amazing. life, real life piece of shit. Um, <laughs> but that's it's, so funny. but that's so crazy, man. I mean, and I, I just want to take a couple seconds just because it's so new. Um, I mean, were you like shitting yourself that you got that part? Oh yeah, I mean, I yeah, I think super nervous because I love the franchise you know so it was like oh well we can't fuck this up we do this we have to do it right then we read the script and it was incredible and so then the nerves became okay now it's ours to mess up like holy shit i mean it's crazy like i I don't think i ever thought i'd make a scream movie i don't think that was ever like i I didn't i didn't set my dreams that high (laughs) you know what i mean that's awesome i mean did you have like big aspirations to be i mean because you've been in because I was going through your IMDb and you've been like doing acting in small roles and then you did the, the series with uh, what is it, Chad, Matt, and Rob Interactive Adventure, which I yeah. kind of went through a little bit, which I thought was genius because you utilize YouTube as a choose your own adventure and you'd click the end to, to be like, what are they going to do next? I thought that was brilliant. What a great use of <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I was like, it's fucking great. But when you started that like has this been something you've always wanted to do like acting and directing is that something you want to do as you were a kid and like that's something you had in your head through Link Gaty and all that stuff like until present day I you know no I mean the short answer is no I don't I because I don't ever thought I don't think I ever thought it was a, a possibility to me it was like being in a band and doing fan stuff was so great because I knew that all I needed to do was be with like my three or four friends and we could do it and that was it and with movies, I was like, well, yeah, I don't even understand how that works. Like, that's not a thing that I could ever be involved with. And then but, you know, I was always obsessed with movies, I always loved movies like and, you know, when in Link 80, like we always sampled movies in our songs. And it was like, you know, we were very I mean, you, your band was named Lane Meyer. It's like we all like we come from loving movies. And so I think I always wanted to be involved in movies. I didn't really know how I definitely never wanted to act. That was sort of a byproduct of me wanting to be a writer and write being a writer not working out and my now wife at the girlfriend at the time but telling me like well you should go try some other stuff so you can really understand the process and I was like okay and then I kind of fell into that for a little bit for fun like and and you know one thing led to another and we started making I mean honestly it's really funny because it does all go back to band stuff because for me it all is about collaboration and working with people you like to make something you like. And that's what happened. Like I, I started taking these acting classes like on a whim that I was very uncomfortable with and sat down next to now who's one of my best friends, this guy, Chad. And it wasn't, he wanted to be an actor. He moved out here to be an actor. And, but the whole grind of being an actor, I mean, like hats off to people who can stick with that because it's just a grind, you know? It's like every day you have to go out prove yourself and you no matter how good you are you probably get rejected we were like fuck it there's this new thing called youtube like let's just go make stuff let's just start doing it and kind of punk rock style yeah diy as fuck (laughs) exactly like let's get a camera there's this new thing that we can just post videos on and let's start doing it and i think the aspiration was always like let's try to create our own thing and we did we definitely were like let's let's aim for the that someday we'll be able to make movies but i don't think we thought it was realistic but the choose your own adventure was a big turning point because that's when we were able to tell longer stories on youtube it wasn't just like five minute shorts it was like oh now we can do like a half hour thing and really start to explore storytelling on like a bigger level and then you know one but every every step of the way led to the next step in a very direct like we learned something here and it got us our next thing I mean, nowadays with Netflix and all that, that's why I think people... I mean, for me personally, I don't really go to the movies anymore just because I like the long, elongated story, I guess. So I like, I like to have... I, I like that, and I like when the story is expanded. I mean, granted, you guys were doing like two-minute short films. Things. It's not like it was like 100 hours or hundreds of hours. No, they were like little, you know, one gag bits, basically. I think like all these little bits really tie in to you playing music back in the day, because I think there's always something built in people where 
it trans it like just follows them through their life and it just kind of it helps them do like little things here and there that are creative or whatever that is and but you could see it kind of uh spawns from when they're younger and they keep that with them so it's kind of it's super cool that I, especially at the same time there's like this little tiny t- tiny element in this podcast where i just see i connect the dots between where someone was and where they are now and like certain mindsets that people have or they envision something I talked to like Max from Say Anything and he was just, yeah, like I just saw that I was going to do this and I just fucking did it. And then like Ian from Newfound Glory was like the same way. And then other people were like, yeah, we didn't really have any path we were taking. And then their band stopped shorter. So I think like sometimes like you just have this vision, but it's funny that you didn't really have any aspirations to do like something like Direct Scream, but you did it. And I can imagine the fucking high you must be on right now after it's all. Yeah, it's launched. crazy because it's like it is. I you know it's corny, but it's a dream come true. And I mean, it's. I think. I think it's. You know, like I was saying earlier, it's hard to envision doing something like like I I envy people who have that ego to be able to be like I could do that. And I think, but I think you get there along the way because you know it's like any any kind of endeavor it's just one step at a time. And then all of a sudden you're like, Oh, I've actually done a lot of stuff and learned a lot of things over the years. And, you know, I don't think I'm like conscious of that while it's happening. Well, at some level for sure. But it, but it's so interesting what you're saying, because I do think one of the key things for me was our singer, Nick, who was like, I don't know, 17 when I met him, 16, 17, he had that drive and that like ambition to be, he thought of us of the band as, as like, we can go be a big band and do a thing. I never thought that way. I was like, yeah, we'll play Gilman and we'll play some shows and it's fun. Like, these are like my best friends and it's going to be a good time. But I never was like, oh, we're going to go be on a label and do tours and all that kind of stuff. And that was really him pushing that. But I, I picked up on that and I took that with me after the band. I was like, oh God, like that was, that was rare to meet someone who has that kind of ambition. I'm going to kind of try to like, harness whatever of that I can harness and just like, you know, have a little faith in myself and the people that I work with. And then I also had like a another kind of serendipitous moment because I moved to LA with the guys who eventually became the Lonely Island. And so I lived with them. That's crazy. Yeah. So that was my those were my roommates when I first moved to LA. And like I lived in what was quote the Lonely Island was me and the three of them. And seeing their trajectory too of, you know, being comedy but being very similar and like, hey, we're just doing our thing. We're going to do it and we're going to kind of push it up the chain or up the ladder. That was all that was also those are the two kind of things that for me were the most like inspiring to just, you know, amongst a ton of other things, obviously. But they that, that attitude of like get your friends together, do a thing you care about and you're passionate about and just make something. I also think, too, that the one thing I've seen is sometimes it again, this is this it kind of applies to what you're talking about, but it it kind of separates itself as well. It's where people, they really aspire to be a certain thing, right? Let's say that, let's say Adam, uh, who took over guitar after you you were out of the band. And so let's say he wanted to be like Nick, right? He wanted to be like a lead singer like Nick, which he is now in like Omnigon. Um, you know, but if he was like, oh man, I want to be as big as that guy personality wise. And, you know, obviously Nick like passed away early, but like he had those aspirations and that big personality, and the band was very well known at that time too, and they're still obviously known. Hence, you know, we're talking about it. But I think like sometimes, and sometimes someone sees that and they're like, oh, "I want to be the lead singer of a band," and then they try to do that and it doesn't happen. All of a sudden, they're like something completely different and huge in that aspect, right? I was gonna try to say like, there's a the connection here would be that you saw Nick and be like, "Oh man, I want a big personality like that," or then you saw like the Lonely Island guys and like, "Oh, I want to be this big comedy thing," and then those didn't work out and then you're like oh i now i fucking directed scream but it doesn't seem like you were that it doesn't sound like you were that kind of person being like fuck i i keep i i am not going to get to the thing that i want to be no i think for me it was like it was more i just really respected nick and the lonely island guys and then also other like mike park like just you know like friends who were really capable of like believing in themselves believing that they could do it trusting their gut you know and just kind of like working like nose to the grindstone working and and knowing that like the thing and i think you know anybody who's been in a band knows this knowing that you make a lot of dog shit before you make anything people like 
and being cool with that and just understanding like that's part of it. Like just you're going to make a bunch of stuff and you're going to kind of learn how to do something and kind of find your voice and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's a process. And I don't I don't like I remember that that was something I was always I conceptually understood, but I don't think I really knew what that meant until I was kind of doing it, which I feel like is a pretty common theme with people who are in creative endeavors. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. You just, yeah. cause you, you kind of have an idea like the first time you do it, it's exciting and then you're in it and then it becomes kind of your thing, which also puts a little pressure on it. If, if, it, if you're trying to like live off of it maybe, or if it's like your constant thing, but then, then that's where you're going. Yeah. That's where you start beating yourself up, but it's like, you still have to keep doing that shit. And then you make, that one thing that works then it like just pushes you in a direction in a new direction where it could be like a bigger path a hundred percent and i don't think that like like for me i don't think because I, I i work with chad and tyler are the two guys i work with and this might annoy them but i don't think i've ever lost that band mentality i think i've just always held on to it because i think it's it's just what i know and it's what you were talking about earlier it's when you're younger and you develop that kind of those muscles they, you just sort of take them with you. It's kind of becomes who you are, you know, and it's not like, I mean, I haven't been in a band in, I don't know, 20 years, but like, I still feel like a band dude on some level. I'm going to work back up to this, but just like a quick answer. How long were you in the band? In like 80? Yeah. Uh, I think we started in 93 and then I left like shortly after Nick died, like 97, 98. So like five years. That time right there. And how old were you at that time? I was probably, I must have been 15 to 19 or something like that so the amount of shit that you do and then you guys toured right yeah yeah so it's like touring in general just elevates you to this different level of where you're not going to forget that because you are just you're you're living you're on your own especially back then i mean i talk about so many interviews where you didn't have the the cell phones the instagrams and all the email and shit to get you know so it's like as soon as you leave your neighborhood, or at some point you're driving in the van the first time and you're like, this is the furthest away from home I've ever been without parental supervision. And then you keep going. So it's like, how do you forget that? No, you don't. I mean, it's like, I, I you know, I, Joey and Aaron from like 80 are still two of my best friends who I text with at least every couple of days. That bond has never gone away. So much of it is based on just obviously we've done a lot of fun stuff since then together but the touring especially i mean you're 100 percent right it's it's the touring that i think really solidifies it all because especially then in the 90s it's like you don't have access to anybody else you don't have you don't have there's no like lifeline you're just kind of out there on your own and you're figuring it out and we're like 15 16 17 at the time i don't know if adam told this story when he was on your show but you know like we left adam on the tour that i met you on in 2000 when i wasn't in the band but i was just touring with him i mean we left him in i don't know somewhere in the midwest and didn't figure it out until like six seven hours later or something insane and had to drive back and we just thought he was sleeping in the back i th- i don't know if he told that i i've i feel I like mean, an idiot it was crazy. Because of <laughs> no i mean it was like you know we we like got out to go get food and he was sleeping you know there was like a hidden area called the hole that he was sleeping in and then he must have got out to go to the bathroom or something and we came back in and drove off and at some point i think joey went down to go to sleep and was like where's adam he's not in here <laughs> oh my and God. we had to just kind of figure it out because there's you know aaron had a pager and that was it see i feel like an asshole because i'm like reading through the show notes from his his interview to be like did he <laughs> talk about this because this was literally just a couple years ago when i talked to him so the fact that i would forget this and be like this sounds like a new story i'm like my god i'm i hate to say i'm getting old but that i feel like he didn't say that that yeah that, that's fucking amazing i know that there was a story where john from bigwig got left and monkey told me about that story so i'm like maybe mixing the two <laughs> It's, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's happened to a lot of people back Wait, then. Wait, was that when you guys were like, because we, we connected with you guys the first time was in Toronto, and then we played together, I think it was Fireside. I, I actually, I, I think we played together at Fireside where we were, we met up with the Wonder Years, and then but we definitely played together in Denver, and then we played in Los Gatos. Right, and Denver was, that was the one with, was that Wonder Years? That was Brian Moss's band in Lawrence Arms, right? That was, yeah, because we were on tour with them, and then that, and then um, Sweep the Leg Johnny played that. Yeah, that was one of the last two last shows on that tour for us. I think we played like Salt Lake after that. And I wasn't even playing that. I was just 
I was quote road managing, which means I would call like one or two venues and then sell merch. <laughs> I was basically like the merch guy. Yeah, actually, it was funny too because when and I know I'm jumping all over the place, but it was funny because when I saw you, I was talking to somebody. I was like, I was like, dude, is that the guy from the fucking Link eighty video? And they were like, yeah. I was like, <laughs> they're like, yeah, it's Matt. He's the old guitar player. I'm like, that's the fucking old guitar player. Holy shit! <laughs> like, I was so blown away. I was like, I saw that guy in a fucking hopeless comp or whatever. You know, yeah, exactly. On the pit. cinema beer nuts or something. Yeah. yeah. Wait, did didn't you direct that or or did you? Uh, no, direct... I didn't. I did the. I directed the Alkaline Trio video on. God, I can't remember what comp it was on. It was Goodbye Forever. It was their first like video, and that was just a where he's like brushing his teeth, and they're like swinging the yeah. llama around. Exactly. That was that was not well planned. I'm not like <laughs> we made an amazing video. That was like Mike Park being like, "Hey, um, this new band I'm working with, Alkaline Trio, is coming to Santa Cruz. Do you want to film a video?" Because he knew I was in film school at the time, and me and my friend Adam Levin had access to cameras, so we just went over to Steve Choi's house. Do you know Steve Choi? He's like RX Bandits and he's, I mean, he's incredible. He's such a wonderful dude. And he, we went over to his house and they were either staying there or I don't know. We just did it all there without really any planning. <laughs> That's awesome. Wait, was he the, does he have a podcast? He does, the Musicians Guild. Yes. Okay. That's, that's what I remember from. All right. I'm going to structure this better. So it, we've covered a lot around here, but like, so how did you get involved Let's go back and move up. But how did you get involved with the scene and then le- having that lead to Link 80 or as a vice versa? Did, you know, So the question I always ask is, did you get involved with the scene and then join the band or was the band the reason you got involved with the scene? The band was the reason I got involved in the scene. I I had known about like Gilman and that whole thing through, we used to have exchange students that my foreign exchange students that would stay with us at my parents house and one of them was from switzerland this guy daniel and he was really wonderful and he he basically chose the bay area to study because he wanted to go to gilman he was like a skate punk guy and this is probably like 92 maybe and he would go down there he's a little older than me and he would go down and i'd be like whoa what's that that's cool but i never really had gone i'd never done it and then i met joey the drummer through a mutual friend and Joey heard me playing guitar and was like, oh, you got to be in my band. And I couldn't play at all. And I mean, it turns out Joey couldn't really either at the time, but he was better than me. And, you know, one thing just led to another. And I was out at Joey's and we were practicing and it it was literally like we should try to play Gilman like that'd be cool. And I think, you know, I could be kind of misremembering, but I think Joe gave me a tape that was like minor threat on one side and rancid. Rancid's album had just come out, their first album, and it was those two things, and he gave it to me, and I was like, oh, this is incredible, and because the, the and the reason we had this connection over punk rock is because my girlfriend at the time, like my first high school girlfriend, she was older than me, and she had an older sister, and her older sister was part of the original Gilman scene, and when we started dating, she had all the lookout seven inches, and you know, she would talk about all those band guys as like in a way that I just thought was so cool at the time. I was like, well, what is this? Like, this is so rad because I was like not vibing with high school. You know, I think a lot of us have had this experience where you're like, whoa, what is this? And, you know, the weird thing that comes out in the wash is I think you basically trade one scene for another, you know, and I don't think I knew it at the time, but I was like, man, fuck high school and these cliques and all this and the cool kids. And I'm not into that. And then, you know, hindsight, you're like, well, yeah, the punk scene was exactly the same. It was really (laughs) no different. Exactly. Uh, (laughs) But I don't think I knew that at the time. It was kind of this convergence of like I had been introduced to the music through my girlfriend's older sister and their music and then met Joey and Joey was into it. And then Joey was the one who was like he was already hanging out at Gilman and Joe's two years younger than me. So, I mean, I don't know, he must have been like 13 or something going over there or maybe even 12. I, I, I don't really remember. But like and so then Joe, Joe was kind of my introduction to the whole like scene. Was Link 80, and this is probably on the line, I haven't read it, but was Link 80 the first iteration, or was there a different name or lineup before that? There were a bunch of different names, but it was the first, It was the band. I mean, it was the same. We had a couple, we had like two singers that kind of came and went, this guy Joey Reichen and Jeff Akery. And Jeff Jeff Akery was kind of in Link 80 for a while, like he did our first demo, and then, and then Adam met Nick, and I think we had Nick kick Jeff out, which is so shady i'm taking uh, over your spot bitch <laughs> pretty much 
but yeah, it was, it was, there were some names and we kind of played, you know, garages in the suburbs and stuff like that for, for a few months and then kind of worked our way towards the scene in a way. Did you guys start touring? I know I asked Adam a lot of these questions, but I'm like, yeah, I'm totally forgetting because you also have different perspective because you were. Well, yeah, we have different time. because he joined the band in 98, I think. Yeah. So he got later on. So this is awesome. This is like the beginning part. But did you guys put a release out with Jeff? Wait, say that again. Oh, did we release? Uh, we did our first demo. We recorded our first demo in '94. At we recorded it at Gilman. They they did just have a thing where you could just go like set up on stage and record a demo. And this guy Marshall Stacks was running it. He was great, running like the boards. So yeah, we did a demo with Jeff. That's our only thing. With oh no, that's not true. And then we also our first seven inch was a split with this band Wet Nap. That was like the in between. So. Jeff kind of sings a lot of those. I end up singing a lot of those. I cannot sing and I have horrible fucking rhythm. It's not, they're not good recordings. And then all those songs got later re-recorded with Nick. So like, so talk about when Nick joins. Cause that, I mean, that's like that, that's the beginning of when everyone starts to know you guys, that and like the verbal Kent video on cinema beer nuts. Like that's where I feel that's where my eyes were open to you guys. For sure. Nick joined I, I wish I knew like an actual date. It's either end of 94, or early 95. Adam, the bassist, met Nick in San Francisco at Epicenter, which was like a record store slash club where bands would play. And Adam was there like on a weeknight because I remember he woke me up on a school night to be like, I met this dude who's great and he's going to be in our band. And I'll never forget our first practice with Nick was in my parents at my parents house in my bedroom, which we never practiced there. We always practice out at Joey's in his garage. Um, and Nick was just great. Like he was, none of us were that good and he was great. You know, he had the charisma, his vocals were incredible. He was just really fucking talented. So I think that's why suddenly we were like doing a little better as a band. And then also what I was talking about earlier, he had that drive where he was just like, I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to do what we have to do to like make it work. How, did you ever like talk to him about that and say why what makes you not what makes you think this but not making like what makes you think you're this cool but like what have you been surrounded by that's making you want this you know i never that specifically but like i remember having this could get kind of dark so apologies in advance but i remember like having this conversation with him once when we were in new york and there were drugs involved. I wasn't doing them. I was never like a drug guy, but drugs were involved. And it was like this kind of morose conversation about like how I'm, I'm trying to think of how to like say this. I think he had that kind of, I, this sounds weird, but I think he knew or embraced the live fast, die young kind of thing. And I think that was a part this, what we're talking about was a part of that. Like, I think on some level, he felt indestructible, but I think on some other level, he knew that he was just like he had to pack it all in in a way that I don't think I knew when I was a kid. Like now I feel like that for sure because I'm a middle aged dude. I'm like, oh, shit, life is fleeting. It goes fast. I definitely didn't know that when I was 15. And I feel like he did. And I feel like that had something to do with it. I'm again making this up. He never told me that. But I know like he would say things like. Well, like someday, you know, when you write a book and this part's in it, like this is the thing. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm not, <laughs> well, I'm not thinking that far ahead. None of this. But he thought that way, you know? Oh, wow. And he yeah, he and he I, I, I really do think he thought about like things like legacy and like, what are you leaving behind and all that kind of stuff in a way that, you know, most people don't until they get a little older. Or if you do, I think when you're younger, at least for me, you think of it sort of in a more melodramatic way without ever kind of digging beneath the surface if that makes sense yeah i mean again I, i've never like i've smoked like weed and did like fucking ecstasy one you know i'm like a, a fucking yeah yeah, yeah. Giant. We're honest, that's me too yeah okay. i'm a wuss when it comes to like drugs it's not my jam um i could drink anyone at the table but um, so, sounds like, like we get along great yeah, yeah dude <laughs> yeah <laughs> we do this with like with bourbons in our hands i mean i feel like maybe and again this is obviously guess and who the fuck am i but i think if at this point he's what 15 16 yeah, well, like the conversation specifically that I'm talking about would have been summer of 96. So he would have been 
a, a just turned 18. So you got to think when when you're that old, when you're that young, and you're doing some heavy shit, which is you know it's obviously it's on the internet known for all that stuff. I mean, a to be doing that, there's some demons there to push you to do that, and b yeah. There's when you're doing it, your brain's being open to shit that you're not even thinking about because you're putting in this, you're putting yourself in this dark place as a young kid, like you really shouldn't be. And also the heaviness of what he was doing, like that, that's going to make you just either like, I mean, it's going to put you in a dark fucking place, you know? Yeah. And it's also going to make you probably maybe there's something where you're like, oh shit, like maybe you're going to see it as none of this matters. So maybe I should live a little bit faster or it's all, yeah, it's, I think it's all part of the mix, right? Like it's, it's the, you know, and there was mental health issues that at the time, again, like, you know, I did, I was talking to Adam Davis about it on his podcast a few months ago, but like it is there, there were mental health issues that I, none of us quite understood because again, we were kids. If you remember, like in the '90s, mental health conversations were not what they are now. It, you know, it was a little more like hidden. It was people were kind of embarrassed, and like it just wasn't. It was just a different time, and you know, and that uh, that sucks. I think a lot of people are probably dead because of that. Honestly, Nick included. I think it's just. I don't think we knew how to talk about it, and I always remember like that Prozac Nation book came out, which again, I haven't read it since it came out, so I'm, this isn't like a hard line on what that book is but i remember nick's reaction to that book being he was very empowered by it but there was it was about i don't know i mean there was like medication that was he was starting and stopping which was incredibly fucking dangerous on top of these other things and i think it was all this it was just so combustible you know and then i think he's surrounded by a bunch of us who are who are young and naive and not seeing the full picture and not don't and whether that's our fault or not, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, it's being hidden from us. And then what we do know is not quite what it really is. And, you know, we're just like, I mean, he's just on a different level. Well, I mean, what the what, what the what the fuck are you honestly going to do when you're like in a teenager? I mean, there's only there's only so much power you have. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, no, I mean, it's, it's a lot of weight. I, I've talked to all the guys about that a lot. Like we've we all have like major regrets about it on some level. And then also don't know what we would have done differently because I don't know what we could have done differently, but I think we all wish we had done something differently. Yeah, it was a lot. I mean, sorry, I got kind of off track there, but no, it's totally fine. I mean, like at the same time, it's gotta be hard because the, the thing that surrounds the band is the story about Nick. I mean, it's, it's a big thing that happened, you know, and it's like he passes away. And so that's going to be a thing that's going to be asked. And like, I'm trying to like, I think it should shed a light on it, but I don't want to stay on that because it's like, it's probably been said over and over and over again. And you guys are like, you know, we had to go through this. So it's like, it's like, I want to shed a light on it, but I, but not be like, let's talk about that directly. I mean, it's fine. I think it's, you know, I think it's, I, it's something I think we're all still, I mean, we are on some level still grappling with because it's, it was a big deal for all of us in so many different ways. And it's affected our lives in so many different ways. And, you know, and I'm not for good and bad. We'd all love Nick to still be here. And we constantly talk about like, I wonder what he'd be doing now. And that kind of thing that you do when you lose anybody. But we've all kind of. We don't want to let his memory die, you know, and like we're really close with some of his family, like his brother is like one of our like really close friends. And it's just really sad and tragic. And I think it's something that we've never quite pieced together what happened or how it happened in a, in a weird way. Yeah. I mean, I actually, I was thinking about it. Like I can actually very uh, relate a lot because I've, if I look back and I'm not making this about me, I could just be like, I can mirror what you're saying, like, and be, have it be relatable. Like I remember a buddy of mine when I was like, in when I was like six or seven, he was on my soccer team. He like, you know, he died. Uh, I had two, two really good friends that we saw them the day they got in a car accident and died. Like there's like a Lane Meyer song about it. And this is coming really dark, but I mean, it's it's not supposed to be, it's like, but I understand, you know, like a really good family friend, like she got in a car accident. died. Like I have a lot of, I've known a lot of people in my life that died. I, it's weird though. Like, there's a point where, like, I think two years ago, I was like, "Am I cursed?" Because I know people and really bad things fucking happen to them. But like, I know what it's like when you, when you're younger and that happens. And to this day, I mean, every year, 
on uh, like Melissa and Alexis, they were the two girls who got killed in a car accident. And like me and Chris from Lane Meyer and my buddy Bob, we saw them just a couple hours before it happened. And then there's a Lane Meyer song called Broken Dream November that's about them. So it's like we to to the and then like one of their moms is online. So every year on their birthday, she'll post something, and we always like comment or we'll post. Everyone from the high school posts about the day that they died on like Facebook, you know. So it's like. I know what that's like when you lose someone and you hold on to it and then you go back and you think like, could we have changed anything? And I don't think I've ever asked that because it was like, we were just kind of, we saw each other in separate, separated ways before they got in the car. But it's like, yeah, I mean, it sticks with you and it's, it's not going to not, it's not going to go away, you know? So it's like healthy to think about it. Yeah. And I think there's, there's it for the people that I don't know, not like necessarily the survivors, but the people who are still alive that loved those people, you you know, you want to talk about them. Yeah. I mean, I would say, I mean, you could ask Joey, he might say not quite this much, but I would say 80% of the time, Joe and I hang out, we end up talking about Nick at some point. <laughs> like, That's and, you know, we're talking 25 years later. Like, it's crazy. And we've all lost a lot of people since then. It's something about Nick and I think our involvement and how, how it was that, you know, what you were saying earlier about going on tour and you're just like alone and off the grid, and you're the only people you have are each other, and it really creates this bond quickly that is kind of unlike any other bond. It's like a bond or a massive separation <laughs> between. Oh my god, numbers. for sure. When it goes wrong, it's like holy fuck. <laughs> yeah, it's like fuck. Well, I guess we got to still be in this van together for the next ten hours. Cool. I think the only reason I was on tour in 2000 when I met you was because, and I. I <laughs> I love Adam Pereira, who was the bass player. I mean, he's married to one of my best friends, but he was having trouble in the band. He was one of the original guys with, you know, him, me and Joey like started the band and he, he just wasn't getting along with everybody. And it, it, I honestly think they asked me to come so that there would be somebody in the van who could be friends with Adam and talk to him and like <laughs> kind of mitigate the whole the drama that was unfolding. Yeah, totally. And the, you know, the funny thing is, too, is like when when you have to be a part of something together and that 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 thing you're doing is going in the future direction where everyone's like, okay, well, we're all going in this path together and someone's head is going, well, I want to be an ama- I want to be a rock star. And the person's like, well, I kind of want to do this for a little bit. And, you know, that causes that tension, but because you're all, you're all in this little bundle and someone else's, um, what is it like their attitude or their personality if that's disrupting your future, you're going to hate them even more. A hundred percent. You're going to fucking despise them. Well, because you trust each other. You have to, you know what I mean? You like, you, you kind of, you make this like agreement. I mean, it's like a marriage. You're like, we're going to do this thing together and that's how it's going to happen. And then if somebody's not in, you're like, all right, well, fuck you then. <laughs> and actually, and Adam talked about the two. He was like, yeah, we just butted heads with Adam. And then I think after the reunion show, he was like, yeah, we still butted heads. And it was still kind of a thing. <laughs> and again, I was sort of still the one in the middle at the reunion show. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> some things just never change. Yeah. I mean, some personalities just like don't fucking mesh. You I know? think the other guys are still mad at me because I think I sort of forced Adam into that. Uh, <laughs> like, because I was like, it's not right to not have Adam there. And, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm kind of talking out of school. But like, I love all those guys so dearly. Like, it's And it's always, you know, as we get older, it's fun to talk about the drama. Because yeah. it's not, none of it's like real anymore. It doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, gone. Yeah. Uh, like I said this all the time. If you're still holding on to something from like 20 years ago, I mean, unless it was like something really, really awful. Yeah. It's like, you have to laugh at it. And when people still get mad about shit, I'm like, what? are you doing you're like we're just kids doing like having fun like yeah so like when you guys are writing the first like like before 17 reasons um how many because i'm i have wikipedia open so i can like kind of answer this but sometimes this shit's wrong so it looks like you guys have a ton of seven inches out yeah we did a bunch of seven inches most of those songs made it onto 17 reasons re-recorded or killing katie but uh yeah we did a bunch of seven inches and then, honestly, we were supposed to do another one. And then Nick went up to Mike Park after a Skanking Pickle show. We played with Skanking Pickle at, I think, Berkeley Square. And Nick and Mike, I'd actually love to know this story. I should talk to Mike about this story because I feel like I'm just telling you what I remember Nick telling me 25 years ago. Nick just told Mike, like, point blank, like, we don't want to do another 7-inch, put out our album. And Mike was like, all right, I guess, sure, I'm going to start a new label. You guys will be the first album. 
let's do it. It was like that kind of thing where, again, Nick had the foresight to be to know that we have to put an album out. We can't just keep putting out seven inches for year after year. So leading up to that, like when you guys and this is going back a little bit. I mean, because you're saying like he was a big presence and he knew it and he knew where he wanted to go. I mean, when you stepped on stage with him, like the first couple times, did he just launch into who he like was automatically or did that take time? Uh, Both. I mean, it definitely was present, but it took him a little time to kind of he got better. I mean, by the time we were done. Or, you know, that era of the band was done. Um, I mean, Nick was like. Just on his a game he was so good and it made the rest of us better you know what i mean it just made everything better at first he was more you could see that he was wanting to be that guy but he wasn't quite that guy yet i think one of his heroes was davy from afi I, he at first it felt like he was just doing davy i can see that that changed at a certain point he kind of became, became his own person which i think is true for all great i mean when we Everybody. started out, we were like, let's just be rancid. <laughs> and, you know, that didn't work because we're not that good. <laughs> but what a, like, a North Star to have, though, right? You know, it's like you got to go for the best thing and, and yeah, you make it your own. Yeah, for sure. So, like, when you guys started, because I mean, Adam was saying, like, when he would see you guys or knew of you guys, it's like people would just go ape shit for you. So how quickly did that happen for getting, like, a fan base to just fucking love you guys? I fe- It's weird because it's such a truncated period of time right i was talking to adam davis about this how it it feels like a lifetime it's all over like three or four years it's not really that long of a time and like we're in school i mean we're going to school monday through friday (laughs) like it's not it's not a full-time job but we're practicing you know three four times a week after school and on weekends we're playing shows at least two or three every weekend but i would say it happened pretty quickly after nick joined the band it it really became like We went from playing Gilman like once every few months on, you know, opening band kind of thing to like top two bands, pretty sold out or whatever, not sold out, but, you know, packed. It happened. It happened fairly quickly in the Bay Area. And then and then, you know, we go on tour and it'd be like four people. (laughs) Yeah. At a show, you know how that goes. And then our because I I only did two U.S. tours with the band. We did a million like mini tours you know, up the coast, down the coast, Arizona, stuff like that. But Vegas, but two two summer tours that just were, you know, that kind of next level fun. And then those would be like we play for 5,000 people one night and 14 the next night. 5,000? Really? Or just like, are you or maybe I'm or? maybe I'm exaggerating. I think the biggest show we played while I was in the band, we played a show in Milwaukee. I think it was Milwaukee. No, Madison, Wisconsin. And it was like some big festival. But for some reason, everybody paid attention to us. It was it was great. It was so much fun. Did you guys like when you first started? Were people going nuts because of your stage show, or because you guys had songs that were that good? I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. I know once Nick really kind of got into his own, he commanded the crowd, like in the way that any good frontman does, and that was a big difference. Like, but also I think you know, and I can only really speak to the Gilman scene, but. I think everybody who went to those shows, regardless of the bands playing, wanted to go ape shit. Like that was always the vibe. Like, let's go crazy and have fun. And like, it wasn't like a violent, like, let's go beat the shit out of each other kind of thing. It was more like, how weird can we get and how much energy can we exert during this band set? Because we would see bands that we'd never even heard before. You know, we'd be dripping head to toe in sweat by the end of their set. So it was like, it was a little bit of both. It wasn't always like, the band's giving off something great and the the crowd is feeding off of it. It would kind of go both ways sometimes. And you kind of didn't have to be that good, which I think is really encouraging when you're an up and coming band. Where did the grittiness come from you guys? Like I always saw Link 80 as like this, not, how do I put this? Like, like an edge. And I think I even said this to Adam. Um, I th- felt like there was like an edge to you guys. Cause you could, that's what I felt. I, you know, it's funny you say that cause that we've, I've heard that a lot. <laughs> And again, I don't think I was aware of that at the time because this was just our friend group and this is what we did. And it didn't occur to me that it was X, Y or Z. It was just what was. But like, you know, we got in fights a lot and there were always kind of fights around us. Wait, 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 wait. you guys got in fights a lot? 
not not with each other with other people yeah I mean, yeah there were like... always yeah yeah oh yeah there were always like fights and there were fights at the show i mean adam got chased out of one of our shows it you know it was like there was always a thing and a lot of the guys who we hung out with were kind of tough but they were like sweethearts but they were sweethearts who you know if somebody fucked with you they'd take it personally and you know it was the kind of gang mentality in a weird way but Again, I don't think I really realized that at the time. I think I've only noticed that, realized that in hindsight. Because at the time, I just it was just what we did. It didn't, you know. I'm not saying like we went and beat up like innocent people. I'm just saying like for some reason there was always like an air of like a fight might break out. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Which is weird because it's not like none of us are real are like fighters. <laughs> like, like the one thing that stood out to me when we were so we were on tour with Lawrence Arms, our last tour, and they're like, yeah, we're gonna meet up with Link Eighty. Um, a couple times, but we're first we're gonna lead, meet up with them in Toronto, and I'm like, oh wow, like those guys are pretty tough, right? Like I, I was just like thinking <laughs> that, and then I met the band. I was like, these are like the nicest. Like to this day, I was like, these are like yeah, the nicest like fucking people ever. But at the same time, when they when they took, I think it said this Adam too. Like when they took the stage, I was like intimidated. I was like, whoa, like I can see where these guys just have this presence, and also the sound too that they brought out and shit, like. I, th- I feel like that's the, 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 like the sound you guys had was harder. It was like it wasn't like a like yeah. A... We definitely were. We got lumped in with the Scott Punk thing, and I think I mean for my money, I was I was always like we're a punk band. I don't like we have some Scott stuff because we like we like the music, but it's not. It always for me was a punk energy, kind of regardless of the music. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you guys also had horns too. That's what everyone's like. Oh, they have horns. They're a Scott band. And they're like, well, no. Yeah, you're like no, the horns just honestly. The... I was not a good guitarist and the horns did a lot of the work that normally a guitarist would do. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it was just kind of like, yeah, but I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting question. Cause I know that I've heard that a lot and it's funny. It's like, cause everybody is such a sweetheart, but there was that kind of air about it. I mean, I did, I will say this. It's like, we always, we always seem to be fighting against something. And I think part of that, you know, we had our like little, crew remember around the 90s or we had a crew and ours was atrc it was against the rest and it was because it was kind of this middle finger to all these other things where it's like we'd we weirdly had this benefit of being able to play like a hardcore show like a sunday matinee hardcore show and then we'll play that night like a ska punk whatever or just a straight up ska show and the weird thing is is it was great that we could kind of be in both of those worlds but we never were accepted in either of those worlds. We weren't hard enough. You know, we played with Murphy's Law a few times and everybody was great, but it was like the crowd reaction. You could tell like sometimes it was cool and sometimes it was like, who the fuck are these guys? And then it'd be the exact opposite, but the same when we play like a, a lighter show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it totally makes sense because it, it's like, you know, it's it's kind of like the gutter punks. They're like, well, unless you got like the Liberty Spikes and like the, sh- the fucking leather exactly. jacket, you're, you're, not, you're not in this crew and you're like, uh, all right, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's it's, that, it's what we were talking about earlier, where it's like, you know, I think, I, I know for me, and I know a lot of people I know, got into punk specifically because they couldn't, they didn't feel comfortable in whatever social situation they were in. Like for me, it was high school, and I was like, I fucking hate this, and I don't like it, and it's clicky, and I don't know where I belong. And then you get into punk rock, and then you kind of find out that the same stuff exists. And that, I, that I think fueled some of what you're talking about. Because I know like, on our set on the 17 reasons LP, like Nick was Nick wrote some shit in our liner notes talking shit about screw 32 and I think AFI, but definitely screw 32 who was like a band that I loved. And I, I didn't even know that that was in there until we got it. I don't think any of us did. And we were like, why, why does it say fuck screw 32 in our record? Like, (laughs) wow. And I still don't know the whole story. I think somebody slept with somebody's girlfriend or something. I don't actually know the story. So, but you know, stuff like that. (laughs) <laughs> is that like a pretty well-known story i don't know i don't i don't know I, I have no idea i've never heard about that i remember screw 32 they were they on fat i think their second album was on fat yeah they were great they were one of those bands that i got they were one of my favorite bands i think i remember them because there's that fat records video comp and there's this one band did you ever have that comp back in the day um a fat video comp. I'm sure we had it around the house somewhere. Like, it, it was like pink, and it had um, Goober Patrol. Yeah, that opened it up. Yeah, Goober Patrol at the end. They're like getting hammered, and they go pub to pub. Yeah, that sounds really familiar. 
there's there's one of the bands i thought it's either them or swinging utters and someone's like hey do you want to say something before we go out there and all the band members just like are ignoring the camera just like being like fuck off or something and then they play and i was like ew fuck that band like they're actual <laughs> and for some reason i think it's screw 32 i have to go back i have to go on youtube and see that they were by the way always really nice to us that was part of the shock i was like these guys are all really nice like i don't still don't know maybe joey or adam knows that's interesting what was the um, why did he why would do you know why he would have thought like he had beef with AFI because it sounded like, cause you said he was, I don't, I think there was some, we definitely had a period with Gilman where like, I think once people found out that Nick was Daniel Steele's son, which was something he really tried to hide. Like I didn't even know for the first six or seven months we were hanging out. None of us did, you know, cause you know, again, you're in a punk scene, you're being like the rich kid from San Francisco was not cool <laughs> when you're 16, 17. He, I think once that kind of got out, people really started the Puritans in the punk world, we did not we were not cool anymore we were like persona non grata it was like go fuck yourselves you guys are not punk you know which for me is like just another example of like punk ethics gone wrong where i'm like yeah i get it on the surface but also give me a fucking break like i i don't know it's it's just weird you know it's like so sorry this person's not welcome because of who his mom is like that's cool for you what <laughs> No, I totally get that. I mean, now I mean, I always forget that, and then I quickly remember because she put that book out, which caused the whole crazy thing. I think with like you guys and yeah, that didn't. That was a sore spot. <laughs> yeah, you got to think though, because when because you, you're talking about seventeen reasons, reasons, and like you're recording it, and did people find out about that after the record came out? Or before, I mean, I, I, again, the in, in like Berkeley, Oakland, I think everybody who was in the who knew who we were. I think everybody kind of knew that. I think that room, not, it's not a rumor that that truth spread, spread very quickly. So that was before the record was released or after? I, I would just, I would think before. I mean, I feel like it's something we always dealt with. And again, I didn't feel any of the weight of that because I didn't, A, I didn't really care. And also it wasn't aimed at me, but I feel like that's something Nick dealt with a lot. And I think it created this weird thing where he, you know, he had to prove himself on both sides he had to prove that he wasn't just some spoiled rich kid, but I, I don't know. Well, it's like, because I'm trying to think of like, like, like looking at the album and, and like some of the song titles and stuff like that. And it's, you know, because when, when something comes out before and you guys are getting shit for this or mostly Nick, but that bleeds into you guys when you show up and play in a show. And so you're getting this, your, your live shows become a little bit weird. And then you put out a record that like, did you have, was there, I don't know, like, I mean, as far as, the lyrics like he wrote the lyrics right for his songs for the for the songs um most of them i wrote a lot of them too uh, we wrote a lot of them together uh if you ask me now he wrote all the good ones <laughs> <laughs> did it's like did you guys when you collaborated or something like was there ever a conversation like hey man we're getting kind of shit on by the scene like let's address this in some of the songs yeah that was we have a the last song on 17 reasons is called burning down and it's it's literally about Gilman. I mean, it was it was because we got banned from Gilman when we shot the verbal Kent video, which, again, I didn't even really know we were shooting. This was Nick being like, I'm going to get Mike Park's friend to come shoot this video. And the rest of us were like, cool. OK, whatever. Uh, and in and in like classic dumb, don't quite get it fashion, decided to not put any effort into it. And we're just like, cool, just shoot the show. Like, we're not going to like you know, that's not cool, which again, in hindsight, it's silly. Says the director of Scream. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's like, it's, live and learn. But it is, it is the, we, we, we were filming there. It was just, you know, it was just a guy with a camera and a light. It wasn't like some big production. It was literally just standing in, the, I can still picture it from being on stage because it was just a one bright light and a film camera and uh, like a small one. We, we were banned from Gilman for that because, you know, whatever the punk rock guidelines were at the time that didn't fit into it really like you couldn't that's now we were banned they, we didn't play there again for i think like six or seven months and that's when we were playing gilman like at least every other month so how did that affect you guys for playing shows then like did you have to go further outside of um berkeley it's at berkeley right um it's yeah gilman's in berkeley right and then I mean, we and there's so many places back then to play like and it was, you know, every vets hall, every 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 town in the area had 
at least one or two kind of, you know, bars that became clubs that you could rent out or stuff like that, where it was just kind of makeshift clubs, backyards. I mean, there was there was never a lack of a place to play. Did it like hurt you guys at all that you couldn't play there? I, you know, I don't know. I don't think so. Like, honestly, I don't I don't think it really mattered because when we went back, our shows were just as big. I think it was a bummer because we all at the end of the day, just I think, except for maybe Nick, who had bigger goals, I think for the rest of us, it was like we just wanted to fit in a Gilman, you know, and I, I especially like me and Joey and Adam. I don't think Aaron ever really cared that much about it, about Gilman in particular. I, I just wanted it. To, I just wanted to be like a cool band at the cool place I like to go, you know, and be like, oh, we're doing it. Neat. So it kind of hurt a little bit. Yeah, I can imagine that being like, and I was, I think I bring up Fireside a lot because it's like one of my favorite places. But it, that was like that spot in Chicago where the bands, you'd see them, and people talk about this all the time. Like, if a band wasn't playing, they'd be drinking at the bar, you know, and then like Matt Skiba would be just sitting there just drinking, hammered at a bar, and then like the next night or something, he'd get up and just like blow the place up. That's got to feel so fucking cool to be like, yeah, I'm just here on a Wednesday, just drink beers. But tomorrow night, we're going to come and destroy this place. It's awesome. I mean, it's I honestly, you know, to kind of full circle this whole thing, I think that that comes back to I think about this a lot and I can't put a fine point on it. But all of my heroes when I was a teenager were people I ended up meeting. And some of them I even got to know pretty well, like because all of my heroes were like Dave from AFI, Jesse Michaels from Op Ivy. Tim from Rancid, like Blake from Jawbreaker. Those were my heroes, heroes. Like you could have been, hey, do you want to meet John Lennon or, you know, Blake from Jawbreaker? I'd be like, Blake, no question. You know what I mean? Like, so I think growing up in that scene where you're the the people doing the thing that you idolize are also just people next to you at in the club the night before makes it very attractive. Like it makes it realistic. It makes it something that you go, oh, I can do that. Like there, there aren't limits on these things. Like these are just people hanging out. That's a great point. And it happens to be in so and so's night on stage. And I think that's so valuable. I'm not sure why I think it's valuable, but I think it's really valuable. <laughs> no, I no, I no, I. When you said that, I was like 100 percent because I'm a big fan of, and this is getting a little weird but like i'm a big fan of like anybody can do whatever they want you know at least fucking try you know at least fucking try it and if it's not it's gonna at least if you're going in some direction that's big and if you're like let's say it's like i don't know winning a gold medal or something olympics like if someone there's a potentially someone who's gonna be like i want to win the gold medal if you're going that hard to do that and you don't there you might get set off course we were talking about earlier when you're striving to be something else like Maybe part of your path is going to be something bigger in a different direction that's not going to be that one thing. But being surrounded by anyone who, because like I hate people being like, oh, if I tell, and every time I tell it to someone, not every time, but some people, they're like, well, well, what if they want to do this? I'm like, you know what? Like that question right there is why you're a fucking lazy piece of shit who's broke, you know? (laughs) It's like, that's why you're a slob is because you don't try and your mental, your mental state's fucking crap. Um, And I literally think that like anybody could do that. So when you're surrounded by people, that are just like that little little tiny door opening in some direction you're like oh fuck like i didn't know i could do that like i can go do that you know it's like yeah you like you going from being in a punk band to now directing this movie this giant movie like and then all the things you've done in between and then like the one part your girlfriend being like you know why don't you it's like you're doing the writing thing but like why don't you try like acting you're like i don't know and then you did that and you're like i feel uncomfortable but it opened like your mind, the way that your mind is specific to you and it formulates, well, this isn't working, but I do want, like the acting thing's cool. Like now I'm going to do this with my buddies. Oh, we could do our own fucking videos. Like that whole path opens up for you. Correct. I totally agree. It's And it's all this weird, there's a lot of just, you know, luck. There's a lot of work and there's a lot of, a lot of naivete. I mean, I think that one of the things like Chad and Tyler and I always say is like, it's the, it's the almost like sheer stupidity that is valuable. Like the the fact that we can just go, you know, like when we were doing our Chad, Matt and Rob stuff and just shooting videos, you know, for free and we'd spend, you know, just we all throw in like 200 bucks and that would be our budget. And it, it was so naive, but also it had, it was the only way that we could do it. I, I think like, especially when it comes to like film, it's a little easier with bands, obviously, because I think it's a given, but with movies, it you know, you hear a lot like, the reasons you can't do it. And especially now when it's like we have phones in our pocket, it's like become a good storyteller, figure out how to tell a story. And then the rest of the stuff 
you can figure out, you know what I mean? Or you can try to figure out and, it, you know, and it it's hard and it doesn't work for anyone. I think I'm incredibly lucky and I've had so many opportunities that like right place, right time kind of things. Like I don't I don't take any of that for granted. And it, I just think it's I think there's a million different factors in all of it, but they're all valuable. But at the same time, though, if you're really good at your craft, that's like you had just said it that 100 percent you focused and you're good at that. Everything else the, the 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 things around you are gonna you know sometimes and sometimes only like someone listening could be like well i've been good at this for so long and i'm not doing anything it's like i could see that balance um but like if you're really good at that one thing it's gonna make it easier to move in that direction so like you like you getting lucky is one thing but you don't just get behind a camera and direct a giant blockbuster like that just because you're fucking lucky you know it's like sure the way you got connected like that was luck, but you also did something that caught someone else's eye where they're going, that that person has talent and they're they're solid in what they're doing, so I can suggest them without even right. flinching. And we've been making, you know, it's that funny thing of like, and I always remember it, you know, because Bay Area, I remember when Green Day broke into the mainstream and the perception in the world was overnight success you know i think they got best new album and you're like wait i've been listening to their other albums for for years now i don't understand this is so weird we've been making shit together now for 13 or 14 years and it's not it feels like oh all of a sudden it's like an overnight thing and you're like yeah but i've literally been doing this for over a decade with the exact same people and just and you're just a little it's a little step every part of every step of the way yeah, I mean, you have to have that one thing. Like, so for you guys, this is exactly a, this is such a great segue back to this album. So, like, you guys, you put out Seventeen Reasons, and then Verbal Kint gets on this video comp, and then more people's eyes open, and you're an Asian man. But I mean, plus, like, prior to that, like, you guys had a big local following, and then you guys were a name that's known, and then you're, you know, an Asian man, and then you put this record out. So then that's that big thing that you, that just opens more people's eyes to you, and you're like, oh shit, like here we are, like this is the next thing. Yeah. And I think that was just starting to feel real where because I I had spent in 96, 97, I was in college. I went to Santa Cruz. I, I didn't get into Berkeley. I wanted to go to Berkeley and stay close and do the band. I actually didn't want to go to college at all. But my parents were like, please go to college. <laughs> and, and I was really close to not going back to school sophomore year and taking the year off. And I think we had a tour in Japan lined up. And I was I really I don't I did not know what, what I was going to do. And we were reaching the end of the tour and we were in Milwaukee when we split ways with Nick. It's one of those things where I was like, I, I don't know, maybe I might have just dropped out of school and done that full time. I have no idea how, where that would have gone. So this was when you, 97. So that's that when you left the band? Kind of. I stuck around for a little bit with with after Nick died and like kind of sort of did it. But like between school and just like I was I, my heart wasn't really in it anymore and I don't think the other guys were kind of like you've got one foot out the door already anyways because you know the rest of us are now doing this full time and you're down in Santa Cruz five days a week and I come up on Fridays and spend the weekend I think they were just kind of like this clearly isn't working and I was like yeah this isn't you know but it was all love it wasn't like I didn't like leave the band in a huff or get kicked out it was like all right, well, I love you guys. Like, good luck, you know? And I mean, I love what they did with the band after I left and after Nick died. I think it's rare for a band to kind of have a second life like that that's tied to the original stuff, but also it's very much its own thing. And I think, like, I still get, I get, like, messages all the time from people, like, in London and places I never toured with the band who are like, oh, my God, I saw you guys, you know, in Birmingham in ninety in 2001 or something. I'm like, oh, no, it wasn't me, but that's cool. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's actually it's funny because so with Adam, it's there's a kind of a cross pollination thing happening. I don't know if that's the right term, but when I did his because I, rec- I interviewed him twice, I did like a part two where we kind of recapped what we talked about and things I fucked up and then other shit. And I, in the teaser, I did. I think 17 reasons I put that as his teaser thing. And he messaged me. He's like, Hey man, he's like, can you think for the next one you could put uh, the, you know, struggle continues as the image. Cause like I didn't play on 17 reasons. I was like, ah, oh, fuck. You're right. Shit. Sorry, man. You know? So it's like that back and forth where it's like, no, I didn't do this, but I'm part of the band. And you know, they're like, Oh, I saw you. You're like, yeah, it wasn't me. So the, the album's out. You've toured the, the, the U S twice. 
And you said that you left, you parted with Nick in Milwaukee or Minnesota, Milwaukee. Yeah, Milwaukee. Um, what was that story? That was a uh, well. That would take like a couple hours. That's <laughs> oh okay. This is it's a really long story, but I mean the short version is just we were we played the Globe in Milwaukee, uh, which a uh, video of that show just surfaced online within the last year. The whole show was online, which I had not seen and my memory of it had always been that it was one of the most fun shows we'd ever for us not like it was like the best show the crowd was crazy none of that but like i remember us having such a great time and playing a bunch of covers and just like you know not giving a fuck and playing for like an hour which was a lot you know usually shows were like half hour maybe right at the most and so that that surfaced recently which was really emotional to watch but basically, we went back to this birthday party at this dude Ben's house and, you know, shit just went off the rails. I mean, it just was a bad scene. And it was so much of it was like we were talking about earlier stuff that I don't think we understood at the time. I don't think we understood the mental health issues Nick was dealing with. We didn't understand the drug addiction. And at the end of the day, we're just we, like we just want it to be friends doing a thing and it didn't work out that way. And because there was a real we had a hard line on, you know, Nick not can't can't do drugs on tour. It just can't happen. And or anywhere at that at this point, like it was getting severe enough that it was a non-negotiable thing. And that wasn't coming from us as much as it was coming from his family, as by the way, especially as a am a dad now. I'm like, yeah, fuck, yeah, that was the right choice, you know. And it you know, this gets into the whole complicated like shoulda woulda coulda thing but yeah so we split up in milwaukee basically the next morning there was a lot of drama that night did you ever want to do this again i'd be happy to and we could go into it in depth but there was a lot of drama that night and then the next morning i just remember sitting in the van and nick saying so you guys kicking me out and we all kind of mumbled and looked at each other and we're like i'm i mean you know because we didn't want to kick him out like we all loved him and we also all knew that he was the heart of the band at that point like and he was like, well, whatever, I fucking quit. And we're like, okay, great. And then he, I believe, took a plane home. Joey and Adam took a train home because the dude that was driving hated Adam. And Joe was pal and was like, go on Amtrak with you across country. Yeah, because I, I remember at, Adam said that there was a guy with you on tour that was like watching Nick. Yeah, we had, so on that tour, there was this guy, Paul, who was like, again, I I guess Nick's kind of like handler, like we didn't really know, you know what I mean? Like we didn't, I don't think we knew that this was all related to mental health and drug issues. Yeah. I think we, we knew it, we knew it, but we didn't know the depth and we didn't know the like severity of it. We knew the severity of the drugs. We didn't know the severity of the mental health stuff. Um, and yeah, so he, he, yeah, basically, like, you know, we had to call the tour there, and then Nick took a plane home, and they took the train, and we drove across the country in, like, I don't know, three days or something insane. Yeah, and that was kind of the end of it, honestly. And then Nick, I saw Nick one more time. I saw him the night before he died. I went to his new his new band, Knowledge, played this place, Bomb Shelter, and I went to see, them, see him there, and we kind of made up by that point, which was good. And you know, we had a nice time and had a cigarette and kind of hung out and, you know, made plans sort of thing. And, and that was the end of that. I mean, I think he died that night, that morning. Yeah. I've never, I've never really read about it and I'm not going to ask about it. It's not my place. I know it's like online somewhere, but I just remember hearing about that. And then like, then playing with like the link 80 guys, like after it. And, um, and that's like a whole, I mean, I would t- cover that with Adam, but it was like, you don't, you never like, like oh I lost a friend when I was in my teens or like early twenties whatever it was and you know just forget about it like that shit doesn't go away like that that will be with you for fucking ever especially like with what's surrounded to I mean on a small scale you know if you lose someone and you're in a small town and no one really you know they weren't this public figure you know quote air quotes um, and known by people you still remember them and it's like when you're surrounded by this and then you you know you're on podcasts again like this the story keeps coming up because it's you're talking about that period in time that this whole podcast is about. So it's just, that's gotta be, even, yeah. that's gotta be a little weird where it just like keeps coming up and it's either going to be like, I'm going to talk about it or like, I'm not. 
Well, and it's weird too, because it's like, I think, honestly, I think any of us would always be into talking about it because I don't think we've ever quite been able to wrap our heads around it, you know, which is true for, you know, when you lose anybody, I think there's always like a question mark. And, but I think one of the things that's extra sad about the Nick thing is that he's kind of at the epicenter of a lot of tragedy. And I, he lived with this woman named Julie, who was like, just so nice and basically like a surrogate mother and like, just kind of helped raise him and she killed herself shortly after and his best friend was this guy max i don't know if you ever listened to the knowledge album but they have a song together on it called matt that's like really good and really emotional and it's just the two of them i mean he he lives a few or he lived a few blocks away from me down here in la and he died he committed suicide i don't know i feel like almost 10 years ago now his other best friend sammy the mick died in a fire a few years ago it's like there's like a there's like a it's you were saying earlier, like am I curse kind of thing. It's like there's this like tragic, all these tragic stories around it, and it I I can't help but feel like they're all somehow interconnected. You know, I don't want to end the podcast on a fucking bummer, but like, but I will say, like at the end of the day, those times that we all got to spend together were to this day some of the best times of my entire life. It's it just like it's more sad when people are like, "That was the best time of my life." It's like, what happened since then? They're like, "I don't know. I never tried." You're like, "Oh, <laughs> it's like." that's bad but you know you went off and did like a lot of cool shit and currently like literally as we're talking it's one it seems like it's such a cool fucking home run at the moment for you it's been cool i'll say that for sure it's definitely been really fun and i think a lot of the fun though you know to kind of full circle it again is i think a lot of the fun of the past few weeks for me and the past couple years of making scream has been doing it with people i really love and respect and it feels very homegrown it doesn't i i feel like it's easy to look at anything especially a movie or a tv show or something and it feels like it's you know made by committee and a big thing with a bunch of people there are a ton of people who worked really hard on this i'm not saying that's not the case that's definitely the case but it definitely has that vibe of like let's get friends together and do something we all love and that that i think is just you i mean that's like lightning in a bottle right if you can ever capture that regardless of what it is band movies any career, any anything, that's like the best. Well, I know you got to bounce. Um, I was going to ask you a bunch more questions, but I want to be where you're respectful of your time. Um, well, I'm so, happy to do this anytime. I love talking. I no one ever asked me about Link 80. It's fun. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Like you've yeah, so man, like it. the majority of. I mean, obviously the last couple of weeks has all been about Scream, but you've and then you were on uh, in defense of uh, in defense of Ska, which is Aaron Carnes and God, that was fun. Yeah, yeah Aaron Carnes yeah. and Adam Davis. Got a big shout out to those those dorks. Um, had them both on the podcast. They were fun. They're great. I'm glad you got like a little mix of talking about the movie, but then like majority of the Link 80 times, even though it got a little dark here and there. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a long, it's a long time ago. Yeah, but exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, cool, man. Well, all right. So I'll answer two questions. Uh, one, what would you like to plug? It could be about something obviously you've done. It could be something about friends doing. It could be about both. Oh man, I wish I had prepared for this. That's, you know what I'll plug? Oh God, this is so self-serving, but I'm going to make it not self-serving. Uh, I want to plug the end credit song in Scream. So the end credit song in Scream is called Fall Out of Love. And it's this band Salem who Matt Reynolds and Will Gould, I think is how you pronounce his last name, uh, from Creeper. And Matt Matt used to be in a band called Howard's Alias, I think, who toured with Link Eighty. And so, oh, wow, yeah. So long story. There's a lot of there's a lot of band dudes on the on the Scream soundtrack, like a lot, because there's a trio song. So you have, or even ska punk dudes, because you have Dan who used to be in Slapstick on the trio song, obviously, but then also trio in general. Uh, there's two different songs are produced by different members of the Hippos. Um, and then oh fuck, I feel like I'm forgetting some, and then the song I'm talking about fall out of love, but we couldn't find an end credit song. We spent a lot of time try- digging around, tried everything. And they wanted like the studio was like, we-, we could throw money at it. Like it could be like, we'll get a good song, like a pop song or whatever. But you know, I want it to be like, right. You know, and sort of Chad and Tyler and everybody else involved. And then randomly one night when we were like down to the wire, like maybe a week or two before we had to find something. Um, Joey and Aaron from Link 80 and I were just texting about who knows what and then Aaron sent me the Salem EP 
and that song was on it. And I was like, holy shit, this is great. And I played it for everybody else on the movie. And they were like, we love this. We need to re-record it because it's recorded very like, like punk rock. And, you know, we kind of wanted it to be a little cinematic. And so they, with, they, they did, made it a duet with this uh, singer, Carly Hansen, and re-recorded it. And it's the end credit song. But it is entirely because Aaron and Joey and I were texting, like, here's bands we like. And it's a great song. Like, I love it. Yeah, so it's like, you know, it's fun. So that's my plug. <laughs> that's the Salem song. I think, um, I just, I don't know why I'm thinking of this, but like, it's kind of like the Garden State soundtrack. Um, did you remember that movie, Garden State? Oh, yeah, definitely. So like, the soundtrack, I, I have it on vinyl. I mean, it's like, the movie was great, and then the soundtrack's great. And it's like, because that was like, one of his main things, like, I gotta make the soundtrack awesome. We put a lot of love into the soundtrack. Like, the soundtrack is not, it's very curated. Like, there is, it is, it is not, no, no songs are by accident, which I like. I mean, whether people connect to it or not, who fucking knows, but like, it's very personal for us. That's awesome. I mean, it's almost like you make, you know, back in the day, making a mixtape for somebody and now you get to do that for I, I, I That's exactly people. how I thought of it. That's awesome. I, I literally was like, this is like a mixtape. Because again, it's like, the, the one for me, like you mentioned Garden State, the one for me was always pump up the volume because I was like, it had like Descendants and Beastie Boys and Leonard Cohen and, you know, and like Richard Hell or television. Like it had different genres. It was like all over the map genre wise, but it all it had iced tea, you know, but it but it was like all cohesive. And for me, that was like when I was 14 or whatever, when I saw that movie, 13, it, it kind of it felt like a mixtape to me. I was like, oh, this is almost more important to the movie than me is the song in the movie. Yeah. And I've always that's kind of been the high watermark for me. Maybe that was the thing that got you to direct. <laughs> just you're, you're fulfilling your, uh, your soundtrack purpose. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I just wanted to make a mixtape. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, man. So last question. Uh, what scene ethics do you hold on to to this day? Oh, man. I think, honestly, like all of them, minus the ones that aren't real, like the bullshit holier-than-thou stuff, which I despise then and despise now. Uh but I think all of the other stuff, like I, the, I think the, the, the like trusting each other, loving each other, respecting each other, you know, when you walk into Gilman, they, I don't know if they still do, but there used to be, it was like the rules were on the wall, which there's always like this gut thing to like fuck rules. But at the same time, you're like, but these rules are like no homophobia, no sexism, no misogyny, no racism, you know? And you're like, yeah, that's, that's great. You know? And again, like I grew up in Oakland Berkeley's right next door. Like we were all raised by parents who were hippies. It's like, we kind of had that instilled at a very young age to not be fucking assholes. But I don't think it, I don't think it ever hurts to have it beat over your head, you know? And I think that that, I, I don't know if that's true in all scenes. Cause I know we play some shows where I was like, Whoa, people here have different feelings than we do. But for the scene that like I came from, it was, the kind of be all end all was like be a good person and treat people with respect and i think that for me has been the one you know i, I think i hold on to a lot of them 